<laughs> Guys, we did it. We got Jack to ban the Nazis and leave. <laughs> he banned it's himself. the end of an era. Yeah, he banned himself. Oh, uh, what's Jack's uh, retiring? Oh, is he going to spend more time with the Nazis he didn't ban? Can someone? Oh, Jack Jack's uh, moving on to other ventures. Oh, another venture where he's not going to ban the Nazis. He's moving on to other ventures. What the annexation of Czechoslovakia? Let's go. Um, I'm gonna. I, I'm sad he's going. Honestly. Um. Uh, can someone explain Twitter Spaces to me? Uh, it's where you go out, go to find the truth about things <laughs> like uh, Pan Slavism and Pan Turkism and uh, race realism. <laughs> it seems like I'm, the vast majority a lot. of these yeah, topics th people talking about are of, like highly advanced race science. It's no Twitter Spaces is good. It's like fuck Clubhouse sucks. Like people, people just like they got so like. I mean, I'm on record as saying it. You know, I support COVID. I support lockdowns just because like I don't care about the disease. I don't know if it's real. I just like what it did to everyone. I think it's cool how everyone acts now, how everyone behaves, how everyone thinks. And I think like uh, COVID was just so bad for people, even in places that weren't locked down, just made everyone so crazy that like they it convinced them that Clubhouse was cool. Like I, I, I looked at Clubhouse once when it was like popping and all the rooms were like, you know, how to get into real estate investing. No, you thanks. know, well, yeah, it's boring shit. Who fucking cares? But spaces is, you know, it's why we're going to miss Jack, because he recognized that his completely mentally ill user base <laughs> uh, would take this boring concept of a room where everyone can talk and make it awesome. What were some of the what were some of the spaces topics? I mean, because I, I haven't participated in one yet, because I don't really know how it works. Does everyone talk at the same time, or is it there's like a host and then? Uh, from can... what I understand, yeah, there's a host who then can allow people who are listening to uh, comment. It seems like it's the closest thing we've been able to get to like call in talk radio on uh, the internet so far, which I guess is what Clubhouse was too. Although I never fucking even paid that a, a second's attention so yeah clubhouse sucked but like this is i mean the fun's gonna be over soon unfortunately but like there was an awesome like israel versus palestine room <laughs> so, uh, there was a uh, there was one where it was like ask a nazi anything <laughs> and it was this this guy being was like, it jack? Well, like it was jack yeah uh because he didn't ban them uh it, it it was this guy saying like, well, like I think like the U S should just be divided racially, but there should be, we should put moats everywhere to divide. It. <laughs> like, like, and then it's like, but it's like, I love it. It feels so much like how things used to be because like when someone, there was like a really like transphobic space and people just fucked it up. People just ruined it for like the guy that started it. And it's like, that is kind of how things used to be. You know, you got a little bit of the new, uh, the new internet and a little bit of the old. And I, I really like it. Like whenever someone like, you know, does make a really terrible room, like people just really, really fuck it up and like ruin it. But I, I do unfortunately think like the fun's going to be over. Like the daily beast is probably going to write an article about all the spaces I, I personally have been attending <laughs> and enjoying people ruining. Uh, yeah. They're going to talk about know, how it's like radicalization is happening in Twitter spaces. I think it's like the, it's causing the opposite of radicalization because it's like if you went to like the Nazi one or any of these, like when you ever you actually hear some like someone like the transphobic one, like you heard like the transphobic guy talk, you'd be like, this guy's a fucking idiot. Like I'm probably I'm pretty sure it like swayed more people against him. Is that the guy who was just like, kept posting? Is that the guy who was like, they're calling their buttholes pussies? Yeah, 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 yeah. That was him, <laughs> and that guy actually is Tariq Nasheed's enemy. Okay, well, so I'm like doubly against him. Mm -hmm. uh, Tariq Nasheed but, had a space that was something like, "Are black women too publicly visible?" or something like that. It's look, it's just like, I, I, I hope these stick around in their current form because it's just it's good old fashioned fun. But like the fun never lasts. They're gonna they're gonna moderate it, and then like all spaces will be like, you know, what's what's the what, what's the best way to get into like house flipping? You know, Airbnb for beginners. Just shit. They're shit. gonna turn it. They're gonna get rid of it and replace it with Twitter bodies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we did should you, we should do one. Did you see Did you see uh, D Ray today when like Jack announced he was uh, retiring? D Ray just tweeted the Black Power Fist. <laughs> <laughs> Man, 
I will. I, that's, but I feel the same way. I miss. Uh, I, I will we, miss him so much. Should we get in before it gets before it gets um uh sort of censored and moderated? Uh, should we get in with a uh, Twitter space? Uh, women. Are there too many of them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> I just. I think that's the way to go. You just have to go like inflammatory title. Like, should it be illegal to celebrate Hanukkah? <laughs> let's find out. Let's let's debate the issue. It's 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 cool. I think that um, you know, unlike Clubhouse, people on Twitter, uh, they just have the impulse that someone they didn't know three minutes ago, they're like, I need to destroy this person's life. <laughs> like I hate them. <laughs> it's what makes spaces cool. I'm gonna do uh, a pit bull I'm, holocaust when space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Should should pit bull owners be on the no fly list, or should we just kill them? Like, yeah, shit like that. Um. Just my advice to everyone is like enjoy these while you can. Uh, Nothing fun lasts. It's just how it goes. You know, you can't complain that much. It's just that's life. We all know it. You, you just got to enjoy the good times. Okay, how about this one? A uh, a Twitter space titled uh, "Which Nation in the Balkans is Best?" Mm. And then it's just me discussing the films of James Glickenhaus while people that's scream a, at me. Th that's the best bait and switch <laughs> to do like super inflammatory title, but the content is like as boring as Clubhouse, like. Like like doing doing a room that's titled like um uh okay for real which race smells the worst <laughs> but when you get there I'm I'm the only speaker and I'm like do we really think USB C made computing better <laughs> I could do my old troll of uh, just reading Finnegan's Wake from start to finish <laughs> that's a good one. me and you did that one together that's yeah. a good one <laughs> that's dude yeah there's so much right. fun to be had while well, you can still have it. Like I will say, uh, Felix, um, you uh, you shared something the other day that has you know sort of riveted me to my core. I've been uh, I've just been pondering this deep dark truth about sort of the cycle of history. Uh, you wrote, "Swag men create dope times. Dope times create dripless men. Dripless men create fuck times. Fuck times create dope men." And I, I know that you need fuck times to get dope men, but I worry that we're in the fuck times cycle of history right now. Yeah, I mean, we definitely, we, we are, but like, okay. The time, like, I would say like uh, first year of Trump to the three years before that, let's say that's the swag. Do we agree that's the swag time kind of generally? Oh, that was swagged out. Yeah, this is a swag time. Okay, but we only got there because we were in a fuck time, which was the 2008 recession. That led to modern streetwear and Adam 22 and phase banks and all all the all the dope men that created dope times it's like it's it sucks but that's that's really how it goes that is this the the chinese first came up with this when they they called it the dynastic cycle <laughs> when they invented it is there when they they had the, they had the world's first recorded dope times 9000 years ago i just I, but of course they had like dripless men the mongols attacked them <laughs> Wait, That's you, wait, why wait, they wait, did wait, the invasion so that they could get some drip. Yeah, but then the Mongols were dripless. But then they created a dope time. Then they were. Then they looked cool. Then after they became cool, that led to fuck times, which was the creation of Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. I am buying. The, I'm just kidding. I'm buying the dip on the lira. I stand with Turkey. Trust the plan. Turkish exports will account for 100% of the economy by the lira now. I just, uh, I, I worry though, is, is there any way that, to, that we, is there any exit from this like relentless cycle of history? Like, I mean, I'm just saying like through prudent policy, can we sort of lock in the dope times and prevent the fuck times? Can we prevent dripless men from creating fuck times? Will, what you're trying to do is immunitize the swag eschaton. And that's just not, <laughs> it's not possible. I'm sorry. I am a little bit more of an optimistic person than Matt. I think Matt is convinced that we just have to do this cycle forever. But, you know, due to human improvement, due to the sum of our knowledge, the drip's always going to get cooler. The times will, the dope times will always be doper. And hopefully the fuck times will be less fucked. What I think is we're probably going to keep doing that. But potentially, because of technology, we could reach the dope singularity. <laughs> okay, so, okay, like, uh, like a Roman Empire, first century AD. Kind of a fuck time. But then birth of Jesus Christ, 
swag king. One of the dopest men ever. And the son of God, if you believe that. <laughs> Which, I mean, even if he wasn't, okay? And, you know, it's there's a 50-50 shot, okay? And that's pretty good odds. Okay, but then, but then, good okay. enough to become a Christian. But then the, uh, you if know, you the, want. The, the Roman Empire, uh, the Roman Empire becomes too swag. Then it falls. Fuck times. I mean, but it was because that they got, because they become too Christian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that led to who were the dopest men? The Muslims. <laughs> okay, and then a new cycle, a new cycle begins again. Yeah, because they're like they had like a whole dope area known as Iberia. But then like they were too they, it became too easy for them to be dope. And so they like lost. They lost to like a bunch of guys that didn't even speak Castilian. They lost to a bunch of guys that like were grew up in a river. And but then the Spanish became cool. The Spanish, the Siglo de Oro in Spanish that translates to the age of dopeness. <laughs> but that that that's perfect because they had so much dope shit, so much gold from their conquest, so much drip that it created. It so much drip it caused hyperinflation. Yep. Under Philip II, who was I'm sorry, a swagless man. Absolutely swagless. This, okay, it, dude. Right, this let, theory applies to right, everywhere. Right, it's Matt, crazy. Matt, 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 Matt. Let's apply. Let's apply the cycle of dopeness to Napoleon. Okay. And the French Revolution. Got it. Um, where are we, we going to... Okay, Napoleon. Okay, French Revolution. Um, sort of fuck times. That's or, definitely fucked. Yeah. That's pretty mm-hmm. fucked. Yeah. It's very fucked. And then so, Napoleon, obviously, the, the, the man on... Swa- the swag on swa- horseback, basically. <laughs> 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 Coming into history and creating a, a, a golden age of swag of for the French first French empire. Uh, but then... Then the, the restora- then the the restoration, yeah, dripless, fucked, absolutely drip. Oh my god, the 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 returning bourbons, uh, Charles the tenth, absolutely uh, swagless. Um, so yeah, I just uh, it's crazy if you just like study history how you can see cycles repeat themselves. And I just like I said, I I I worry, I worry the swag, the 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 last embers of swag are fading, and we may be uh, we may be headed into fuck times because we got too swag. But that means our grandkids will be dope. <laughs> pretty cool that's all you can hope for i mean yeah look look it, it just that's that's just how it goes that's just how it goes and sometimes you are it's like lenin said sometimes you know there are years there are decades where nothing dope drops there are no brailled belts and sometimes there are weeks where everything is dope everything dope happens i think that's what he said that's true you did say that yeah so it's like uh... in, in 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 the state and dopeness by Vladimir Lenin. <laughs> it's sort of like a swag sara, con- sort of this concept of uh, rebirth and death, and um, just the uh, just en- endless cycle of things coming out of uh, dopeness and going into fuckness. Um, evidence of our fuck times right now. Uh, the Jelaine Maxwell trial is starting today. Boys, let's go. Um, our girl is, um, she's seen the inside of a courtroom for the first time. Jury, jury, a jury has been selected and we'll see where this trial goes. I don't, I don't really know what to expect here. My suspicion is uh, nothing interesting or of note will come out of it because the fact that she's still alive means that probably she's been replaced by a robot, obviously. <laughs> yeah. But I would just like to um, uh, go into some uh, uh, news coverage of the trial today. Or not news c- coverage. This is sort of like a, this is a piece um, in uh, Bloomberg. This is under the Bloomberg Equality Vertical. <laughs> <laughs> titled Jelaine Maxwell jury confronts rare case alleging female sexual predator. Uh, it says here, uh, Jelaine Maxwell's sex trafficking trial is set to kick off as one of the biggest of the hashtag me too era, but the jury selected Monday may have to grapple with a unique question. Is Maxwell herself a victim? It's a good question. It is very good. Uh, most criminal defendants are men in these sorts of sexual predator cases, said Moira Penza, a former federal prosecutor in Brooklyn, New York. This case is unusual because we have a female defendant. Whether some people might be more or less sympathetic to Maxwell, 59, a woman has hung over the jury selection process. The 12 jurors and six alternates were picked Monday in Manhattan Federal Court, with opening statements to begin soon after in a trial expected to last into January. If convicted, the British socialite faces as many as 40 years in prison. 
The jury selection got off to a bumpy start on Monday with two potential jurors not showing up at all and another who forgot getting into the courthouse late. A few also raised their hands when U.S. District uh, Judge Allison Nathan asked if they had read or heard anything since last week and could still be impartial in the case. Among those dismissed was a private equity worker who had previously expressed concern about serving on the jury due to his, quote, proximity to high-profile individuals who have been linked to Maxwell's ex-boyfriend, Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> that guy, yeah, no, <laughs> high-profile individuals, not like, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I, like, bought my wife from her. <laughs> my bad. I, I, so the lawyer asked if they had heard or read anything that would, like, sway them. Gotta say, another huge L for article heads. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just if you read an article, fuck you. I'm just imagining getting like paneled in jury duty for the the Jelaine Maxwell trial, and I'm 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 sitting there, and they're like, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm sitting in the jury box wearing uh, the True Anon Bush did 9/11 T-shirt, and they're like, now, <laughs> have you read anything about this case, or uh, can counter anything that may bias you? And I'm just like, nope, definitely not. <laughs> Not familiar oh, I, with it. If I got if I got asked to be on uh, uh, the Ghislaine jury, I would absolutely lie my balls off. Oh God, yeah, yeah. Like, have you ever have you ever s have recorded yourself talking about this case and released it publicly in any manner? No, 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 definitely not. Yeah, you just have to be like, I've never read an article. My TV has never. I have never actually seen anything except for NBC's Wednesday night lineup. That's the only I've never seen a piece of media that wasn't run through Ken Olin. That's why I feel so bad for these jurors, because they are just pristine minds. They're 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 just holy innocents who are now just going to have to be waterboarded with this shit. The today when they were talking uh, in they were doing like the jury in paneling today, they asked one of the jurors if they had any knowledge about the case. And they said, uh quote, I believe I was watching football and I just switched over and the news was on and I just, you know, heard that he committed suicide and Miss Maxwell's name was mentioned briefly and I just kept it and uh, went back to watching football. That's all I could really remember. <laughs> oh my that God. Guy, that's that guy is so pure and now, now he's going to have to fucking know about this stuff? That is, I didn't think about it from that angle. That is really sad. Like, holy fuck, like so many like just perfect like cattle Americans who are like, um, oh, I just, I never, I, I never miss an Oakland Raiders game. Yep. Yeah. You know, I, I was, I did a, I did a semester at sea that docked out of Oakland when I, in 1981. And so I love the Oakland Raiders and I only watch, <laughs> I only watch that the United States of Al. Um, <laughs> and he's going to like, that guy is going to hear the most sordid shit in the world. It's going to be him. It's going to be like three old women who are all named gay uh, it's just perfect, innocent Americans. Very sad. Do I know who? Do I know who Joe Biden is? No, I don't. I've been watching NBC's La Brea. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna they're gonna seek out people who think that Joe Biden is Donald Trump's dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be who's on this fucking. Jury. I mean, like that is really the way jury selection works in any case in America. Like they're trying to find, they're trying to find like the smoothest brains in America, like the people who don't have any frame of reference for anything that's going on. Yeah, you say smooth brains. I say uh, transcended and enlightened brains. Because <laughs> yeah. what the hell does all of this information do for anybody? What is knowing this stuff? How does it help? Well, gets you out of jury I mean, duty. They, they are right. Yes, they are that's right. the one thing it does. <laughs> but it gets you out of jury duty for what? So you could read more fucking articles? Like, I, I ooh, okay. So, you know, we've seen a lot of this shit where people are like, um, oh, like go to trade school. Uh, you'll make a lot of money. Um, well, I mean, they're just, look, if everyone you're telling goes to trade school, goes to trade school, I got bad news for you about how much money all those jobs are going to make. But one job that is going to make a lot in the future, no matter how many, because most people can't do it, most people won't do it, is you can be someone who you are a professional juror. You don't, you've never read an article, you don't know fucking anything, you don't know how to open Twitter, you have to call your building superintendent to turn on the oven every day. You're not allowed to just operate it on your own. And your job is that you serve in different juries because too many Americans in major cities spend 18 hours a day looking at their phone and getting mad yeah. and reading articles. Mm -hmm. 
They can't be on juries. No, no. We, no. we need we need a class of people who are just essentially kept in veal crates watching reruns of The Office. <laughs> yeah. Like, yes. oh, that Michael Scott. <laughs> He's like my dad. That, oh my, yeah. No, that will be, and that will be like the only job with social mobility. That's the only way that you can become PMC is be, by being a professional juror if you're not already. But then, unfortunately, your kids will be article readers. I know. Yeah, I mean, it's we're now we're back to the 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 the, the fucked uh, drip cycle. Um, yeah. But no, no, it's like yeah, like the people who want to be history's actors the most, the people who you know, the, 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 who want to be a uh, one of the twelve angry men, um, uh, they don't get the opportunity to because they know too much. They know too much, so they they by <laughs> by being. <laughs> By being moderately aware or having opinions about current events, they prejudice themselves before a lawyer even gets a chance to do so for them, um, which is dangerous. So, I mean, like, I, I just worry, though, because, I mean, obviously, it's it's hard if you want to see justice done in this case. And obviously, that would mean Jelaine being totally exonerated um, to uh, to get on the jury and do that. You know, but you know what? Let, let's read the article more because I, I think it's painting a picture. So it says here. Cheryl Bader, a former federal prosecutor who now teaches at Fordham Law School, said such a defense could work with some jurors, uh, re referring to um, just uh, the idea that she was a, a sort of enthrall and a scapegoat to a rich and powerful man. Uh, People hold complex worldviews, said Bader. A Me Too juror seems more likely to want to hold Maxwell accountable for her enabling role. But they might also be open to seeing Maxwell as herself a victim of a controlling abusive male. I think it will come down to how well the defense can cast Maxwell as just another victim of Jeffrey Epstein. Um, I'm going to be watching the trial to see how well the defense can make that case. I like I honestly don't know what the fuck to expect from this from this trial. Um, I have no idea. I would I would move to think that whatever fix could be in is probably already in. I do think it's interesting. Did you guys see that list of like fake Maxwell co-defendants for the criminal trial go around? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And it was like so it was someone, just like yeah. Jay Z and Kanye West were on it or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, there was someone. I I feel like that's because now this is like out of even though this is a federal trial going on that should be pretty high profile. I don't feel like it's going to be covered with the same breathlessness that Epstein was covered, you know, three years ago and two years ago. But I do think that. Like the move will, now that it isn't in the public eye as much, the move will be to like will be like yeah people like that will just like yeah you you'll have like a fake list of co-defendants where you're like oh actually like she's on trial with like Jay Z and like Chrissy Teigen and like all the people you all the people like if you're like an online like uh, like if you if you're sort of a QAnon adjacent person it'll be perfect for you because there'll be just such a wealth of um. Uh, spurious, made but nonetheless shit. tantalizing yeah. details to keep you sort of uh, uh, spinning at all times. I do like this idea, but, and it's the perfect, it's the perfect zone flooding too, because it's like the. I'm sure, yeah, no, like as we know, there are like actual celebrities in the flight logs and in the books, but like it, it keeps you from looking at people like Glenn Dubin or like Leon Black, like huge finance titans, and people like Bill Barr's dad. It will keep you from looking at someone like that if you're like, oh, when are they going to call Jay Z to the stand? Well, I mean, just if, like, those, if, there, if there aren't that many people posting about it or talking about it, but half the people think that Jay Z or like Meek Mill are co defendants, that's perfect for them. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I think you can see it uh, starting a little bit already in the way this article is framed, which is in the context of like, uh, th this is now like, this is a Me Too trial. And how yeah. and how will how will you know like in, in the post Me Too era how will jurors react to like you know a female sex criminal or a female sex victim? And it's just like I I, I don't think that's a really a, a despite the fact that this case does involve sex abuse and rape. Um, I, I mean yeah like is is that really the way? <laughs> is that really what's being <laughs> being adjudicated at this trial here? Because um, it's like I I'd, I'd be interested to see how her defense is going to swing this idea that she was enthralled to Jeffrey Epstein or a victim, um, just like many of the people, uh, you know, the people she's being prosecuted on behalf of. Because it was like, you know, she's just like, uh, I just want to make it clear here: um, enslaving teenagers for the purposes of blackmail scheme is not totally not my bag, baby. Uh, I would turn the jury's attention to Exhibit A. Enslaving teenagers for the purposes of blackmail totally is my bag, baby. Written by Jelaine Maxwell. No, yeah, they're going to try something called the Smithers defense. 
<laughs> uh, how does the Smithers defense work? It would be like the, the lawyers who are getting paid like seven million dollars in, in, in slush funds from this trial are just going to be like this bitch like Smithers. Jeffrey Epstein was Mr. Burns. I rest my case. <laughs> And then they'll be like, oh, there's a gas leak in the courtroom, mistrial. Uh, going Jay, Jay-Z, Jay-Z was indicted. It says here, uh, there has been a societal shift now. And I think often men may view certain witnesses as people who could have been their sisters, their daughters, their friends, she said. And so I, don't ha- so I haven't seen such a sharp division between how men react to victims of sexual violence versus women. Potential jurors were also quizzed about possible biases against wealthy people leading lives of luxury. Maxwell, an Oxford-educated daughter of British publishing tycoon Robert Maxwell, has an estimated net worth of about $22.5 million. And testimony will likely include accounts of how she managed Epstein's five homes, including a private island in the Caribbean. Before she was arrested in July 2020, she had been hiding out for a year in a $1 million rural New Hampshire country house that was paid for in cash. A major issue in all high-profile trials trials is how much media jurors may have consumed about the case. Since his death, Epstein has been the subject of a flood of news articles, podcasts, and the four-part Netflix documentary, Filthy Rich, which included interviews with victims who said Maxwell recruited them, uh, recruited young girls for him. His def- her defense team has long questioned whether she can get a fair trial given the cloud of massive pub- negative publicity that surrounds the case, and potential jurors were questioned about their knowledge of Epstein and Maxwell. One man who said he had once briefly met Epstein was excused after he said the meeting led him to follow the case more than he would have. That man's name, Chris Tucker. <laughs> <laughs> that is like, are we ever going to get to the bottom of that? No, I feel like that. That is like that's the weirdest thing about the entire Epstein thing. Like everything else, like everything else is like awful and sordid and and insane. And it's but it is like it's like you know what it is, right? It's like a Craig Spence type thing. Oh, this guy was running like an international blackmail thing at the behest of intelligence agencies. But like you know, in an ideal society, there would be like a church committee where you figure out how Chris Tucker was there. Like what what, what, what what's going on here? I mean, I, I think you're right. I mean, not, not so much about Chris Tucker, but like the church committee like model is that like in addition to this trial, which is like, look, her, her legal defense is entitled to make any any argument that they think will work. But like, you know, like I said earlier, but like framing this as an issue of like, oh, like a, a post me too case when it's like the ramifications of this case are, 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 are not about. I mean, they are about in terms of like the people who have been victimized by these two people. But like there are there are much larger implications about, like he said, like his connections to the heights of finance, tech, media and most importantly, intel- the intelligence community that, you know, that, that like a, a trial, uh, a trial of this nature, like won't get to the bottom of. But like, you know, like uh, is there has there has there been any hearings in Congress on like on, on this matter whatsoever? One of the epic senators, uh, John Kennedy from Louisiana, who's like a, he's like a Benny Johnson type senator. He like said something about Jeffrey Epstein not killing himself in like an unrelated hearing or something. And then, of course, like nothing. No one, no one held any hearings or anything, nor will they. I mean, if during the R. Kelly case, it had come out that during the original the original trial in Chicago all those years ago for the the tape with that girl. If it had turned out like the prosecutor or the judge in that case had been like, oh, I, I had orders like not to pursue it that much because like a guy higher up at DOJ was a fan. <laughs> you would have heard about that. But Acosta being like intelligence told me he's off limits. That just nothing, nothing. Even in this coverage, we don't hear about that. That was just an aside. That was an aside that we've like we've never gone back to. And there will not be hearings about it because Again, like this isn't people aren't talking or thinking about this in the same way that they were three years ago, which is pretty favorable for them. Yeah. And, and they're able to flood the zone with like just complete fucking bullshit. Yeah. With and like, the remaining people who are talking about it. And just like the way, the, like I said, the way this article is presented about like, oh, like, you know, we'll. Uh, it, could it could it possibly be that jurors will think she's the victim too? like left unsaid being like, you know, the implication that like, oh, like maybe she is a victim. And the fact that this is in Bloomberg opinion, Bloomberg, the, uh, the the media outlet named for Michael Bloomberg, who has featured at least 30 photos with Jelaine Maxwell at various parties and social functions. Yeah, but I, I mean, that has been that's been like all over the coverage. Like, do you remember like Vicky, Vicky Ward, who wrote like 
are like the Daily Beast article that people like attribute with like kicking like kicking a lot of the shit off. Like, did she like fucking hang out with Gil? <laughs> they were like, they're like, oh, everyone knows her. Um, but yeah, like I, I just think it is curious. Um, the way this Bloomberg article uh, seems to be framing the case as, as the trial actually begins. But um, to move on from that, I, I would like to take some time now to look into, like, in, in terms of the way this case is being framed. Um, so the trial started today. And last week, the New York Times um, uh, wrote a big article based on newly released records. Uh, headline, Epstein's Final Days, Celebrity Reminiscing and a Running Toilet. Uh, the point of the article is to be that, like, they looked at the case again, and based on new documents, they can say again that he definitely did kill himself. And you know, obviously, the, the the timing of this is is quite obvious. But nonetheless, this is a very interesting article, both for what it does say and what it doesn't say. And I think it's I I know I alluded to it on um last week's episode, but there's a lot here that I think is worth going into. So this is this is a, a big splashy piece in the New York Times. Um, <laughs> Newly released records show the disgraced financier living a mundane existence in jail before his suicide, while also spinning deceptions until the very end. The, the deception here that he is spinning seems to be that he was murdered, like that, that he killed himself. But in doing so, he was like a, continued to to perpetrate this this world of deception and illusions that he catered to and was a part of. He was doing like an epic prank, basically. <laughs> yeah, uh, it says here uh, the article begins. Uh, the disgraced financier jailed in Manhattan on federal sex trafficking charges involving teenage girls was found unconscious on the floor of his cell one morning in July 2019, a strip of bed sheet tied around his bruised neck. In the hours and days that followed the suicide attempt, Jeffrey Epstein would claim to be living a wonderful life, denying any thoughts of ending it even as he sat on suicide watch and faced daunting legal troubles. I have no interest in killing myself, Mr. Epstein told a jailhouse psychologist, according to Bureau of Prisons documents that have not been previously made public. He was a, quote, a coward and did not like pain, he explained. I would not do that to myself. But two weeks later, he did just that. He died in his cell on August 10th in the Metropolitan Correction Center, having hanged himself with a bedsheet, the medical examiner ruled. After a life of manipulation, Mr. Ep Mr. Epstein created illusions until the very end, deceiving correctional officers, counselors, and specifically trained inmates assigned to monitor him around the clock, according to the documents, among more than 2,000 pages of Federal Bureau of Prisons records obtained by the New York Times after filing a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit. The detailed notes and reports compiled by those who interacted with Mr. Epstein during his 36 days of detention show how he repeatedly assured them he had much to live for, while also hinting that he was increasingly despondent. The clues prompted too little action by jail and bureau officials who made mistake after mistake leading up to Mr. Epstein's death, the records reveal. He says he passed many days closed in a conference room with his lawyers, avoiding the confines of his dank and dirty cell. In conversations with psychologists and other inmates, he spoke of his interest in physics and mathematics and offered tidbits of investment advice. He reminisced about socializing with celebrities, even as he complained about the running toilet in his cell, the orange prison guard garb, his difficulty sleeping, his dehydration and a numbness in his right arm. I just like, like he, <laughs> even in prison, he's still trying to recruit people for the various scams and <laughs> just like very, very just like, um, uh, you know, money, money shenanigans that he was up to and doing it by being like, oh, you should definitely consider um, uh, in investing with me. I, I know Kevin Spacey. <laughs> I hung out with him. <laughs> prison has to be like, I mean, no one wants to go to prison, but for like a middle aged Jewish guy, it's kind of like. You know, it's said that like uh, Biden actually loves it when bad things happen to him because he's Catholic. Like that's the Catholic thing. I think for a Jewish guy, like a jail, like there's a lot to complain about. You can yeah, complain that's, that's nonstop. Yeah. You can natter at people and they can't go anywhere. Yeah. My bed's small. The food is it's terrible in such small <laughs> portions. There's a breeze. And you'd be right. There, there would be. <laughs> That's why I really don't believe that it, me, when I'm elected a senator from New York and do finally hold these hearings, I'll be like, he wouldn't have killed himself because the Jewish guy that age would love jail. There's so much he could have whined about. I mean, it's OK. I'm that age now. I'm 60 when I get elected. Going on here, it says uh, the newly obtained records offer no support to the explosion of conspiracy theories that Mr. Epstein's death was not a suicide. 
They also shed no light on questions raised by his brother and one of his lawyers that he might have been assisted in killing himself. But they do paint a picture of incompetence and sloppiness by some within the Bureau of Prisons, which runs the Federal Detention Center. An intake screening form erroneously <laughs> described Mr. Epstein as a black male, and then in parentheses, <laughs> he was white, and indicated that oh. he had... <laughs> and indicated that he had no prior sex offense convictions, even though he was a registered sex offender with two 2008 convictions in Florida for solicitation of prosecution, prostitution and procurement of minors to engage in prostitution. A few social phone calls were ma were ma he made were not recorded, logged, or monitored records show an apparent violation of jail policy. Well, so, I mean, just that, just that, par <laughs> just that paragraph <laughs> alone right there is very telling. And I understand the people that are writing this, like they, they, they set it up to be like, you know, uh, there, there's been no evidence that he killed himself. But what there is evidence of is a ton of bungles on behalf of the Bureau of Prisons. And I just got to say, I mean, one of these things would be pretty ridiculous. I mean, lo <laughs> entering him into the system as a black man is pretty fucking funny. It's almost like they were sort of trying to lose track of him and then logging him into prison as, as someone without any prior sex offenses. Also a bit strange. And then the fact that his phone calls were not being recorded or monitored on a number of occasions. I got to say, one of these mongols. OK, understandable. Two. OK, that's something smells funny. But like all three of those, like I said, the details in this story, I think, are telling in a way. It's like that was someone who wrote, someone who wrote this article, like trying to make the opposite case. Because, like, I think there's a number of these telling details in here. Like the fact that he kept telling his psychologist, quote, I have no interest in killing myself over and over again. Yeah, the phone calls one is the one that sticks out the most to me. Because it, it's like, you know, I don't know, yeah, whether the individuals that wrote this article, whether they had to write it that way or whether, it, you know, they're, they're along for the ride. But, like... Oh yeah, just a, that, just another oversight that they didn't record this specific guy's phone calls amidst everything else. I mean, it does it does make me think of uh, people kind of discarded this one. People aren't as into this one anymore, but it was pretty big a couple of years ago. The theory that he didn't act like he's not dead. Yeah, it does make you think of that one. That one's pretty interesting. It says here, the night he killed himself, Mr. Epstein lied to jail officials and said he wanted to phone his mother, who was long dead. He instead called his girlfriend. Jail personnel left him alone in his cell that night, despite an explicit directive that he be assigned a cellmate. I mean, I mean, like I, I read this whole article now, and uh, they they just they just set up bungle after bungle on behalf of the Bureau of Prisons. But like, there is no effort in this article to like I don't know drill down on any of the people who made these fucking errors. Like the fact that the most high profile inmate in federal custody could just tell his jailers I'd like to call my mom and have them not be aware that his mom is dead like I said I mean I, I could see that happening for someone who was just booked for like drunk driving or something like that but not a case like this I mean the only way it works is if you're basically saying you don't understand nobody's calls are getting recorded nobody's information is being recorded correctly. This is literally a bunch of submental dipshits just banging into each other uh, and getting paid uh, uh, to do so. And it, it, But the thing is, if that's the case, then why the hell should any uh, argument be credited that says that somebody couldn't have gone in there and fucking killed the guy? <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and also, I mean, the recorded calls thing, <laughs> We know for a fact that's not true because people in New York, like they've had things from their jail phone calls rolled into their Ricos yeah. in a lot of gang cases. So we know that's not fucking true, like in the past few years, in the same time frame. But yeah, as Matt said, yeah, it sounds like, wow, I mean, yeah, it sounds like you're running a loose ship where fucking Les Wexner could kill anyone in there for what, like $50,000? Yeah, yeah, you're you're making an argument that that is such a a poorly supervised and underfunded thing, which I believe that I can't believe anything you say about uh, who was allowed near the fucking cell, uh, how closely it was supervised. I can't have any faith that, that 
that anybody with a little bit of money and motivation couldn't just do whatever they wanted in there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, exactly. This entire article is like, oh, yeah. And for like um, two, for like three weeks, he was in a blanket fort <laughs> um, and we like we couldn't find him. And then another week he told us all to close our eyes and just walked around and like left and came back. But like, if someone came in here, we'd know. No, I mean, like, uh, like, okay, like, so the, 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 the uh, sorry, just read this once again. I said, um, uh, the night he killed himself, uh, Mr. Epstein lied to jail officials and said he wanted to phone his mother. So he's in his cell, and then he's just like, guard, guard, I'd like to call my mom. I, 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 I'd like to talk to my mommy right now. Like, does anything you know? about how you're treated in prison or even just awaiting trial in this country jibe with the idea that he was like, like all the fucking that he was just allowed to like, uh, just be like, Hey, can I call my mom? I'd like, I'd like my own cell please. And they're just like, yeah, okay, sure. I mean, they might as well be saying in addition to these bungles, um, at, you know, on, on several nights uh, during his stay in the MCC, uh, during night, all the, all the doors became unlocked. It's for several, for several hours. <laughs> um, it says here, uh, two days after the suicide, William P. Barr, then the U.S. Attorney General said that there were serious irregularities at the Correctional Center, but did not elaborate. He later blamed a perfect storm of screw-ups. I hate those perfect storms <laughs> of screw-ups. A 15-page psychological reconstruction of Mr. Epstein's death, compiled by Bureau officials five weeks later and never before made public, concluded that his identity, quote, appeared to be based on his wealth, power, and association with other high-profile individuals. The lack of significant interpersonal connections, a complete loss of his status in both the community and among associates, and the idea of potentially spending life, his life in prison, the postmortem continued, were likely factors contributing to Mr. Epstein's suicide. Well, I mean, for that bulletproof fucking bit of uh, mind hunting right there, is a profile that one could write of virtually anyone incarcerated. In yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, their uh, <laughs> self-worth was defined by not being in jail. <laughs> all, the, yeah. all the things that made life worth living for them involved uh, not being in a small cell with other guys. Being able the to leave a room when they wanted to. The inspector general's report recommends that all inmates read ad busters. <laughs> you are not your fucking table. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, he, he, he seemed, he seemed happy and in good spirits until he was facing 20 years to life in federal prison. Um, yeah, I, I think it was like one of the factors that contributed to this, uh, this state of despondence was going from a, a very, very high level of comfort and luxury to a comparatively very, very low level of comfort and luxury. And in fact, one might say none at all in like in the most squalid conditions imaginable. Going on here, it says the Times obtained the materials after suing the Bureau of Prisons, which had repeatedly rejected its public re records requests. As part of a settlement, the agency agreed to turn over internal memos and emails, visitor logs, handwritten notes from inmates, and the psychological reconstruction of Mr. Epstein's death. Many of the documents were heavily redacted. Some were withheld entirely, including a number of records associated with the earlier suicide attempt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh so got, we have a very full picture here of his mental health in the, in the, in the days and hours leading up to his suicide. Uh, going on here, it says, talking about celebs. This is, <laughs> this is a subhead. <laughs> Mr. Epstein's stay at the detention center began on Saturday, July 6, 2019, after his arrest at Teterboro Airport in New Jersey, where he had arrived from Paris on a private jet. Um, going on, it says, um, he initially was placed in the general inmate population, the jail's least restrictive area. In an internal email, okay, keep in mind here, it says, okay, so he was arrested, one of the most high-profile cases in U.S. history. He's arrested at Teterboro Airport after coming back from, on his plane after coming back from Paris. So significant flight risk. They, okay, he's arrested. We know from earlier in the article, he's then logged into prison as a black man with no sex offenses on his record, and then is immediately put in general population, quote, the least restrictive part of the prison. Do the earlier, uh, earlier fuck-ups in this perfect storm of bungles begin to, like, I don't know, take on a different light here? I don't know. Just, just asking questions. It says here, uh, in an internal email, Hugh, Her Hugh Hurwitz then the Bureau of Prisons acting director, later attributed this to an oversight by the U.S. Marshal Service. Raylan, what did I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> Raylan, I got well, you know, oh, it's just, you know, he, he saw a sexy lady before you logged him in. And then he doffed his, he sort of like <laughs> tipped his cat and said, hat and said, ma'am. I hate to admit it, but yeah, Raylan Givens would completely fuck this case up. <laughs> oh, my God. He would fuck Elaine 
like before the case, like completely honey trapped, not even realizing it. He would lose Epstein like 40 times. He would make it so he would make it so like, oh, oh, it's really weird. I have to have an old West shootout at an abandoned public school in upstate New York against Les Wexter's goons. The last thing I wanted to do. Uh, it says, apparently the U.S. Marshal Service did not indicate that he was a high-profile inmate and staff were unaware that he was coming, so no plans had been established, he wrote. The, the, look, I, I, will, I will accept a lot. Uh, you, you can get, you can, this is the brilliance of this, because you can get a really long way with the argument that like, every single institution that like, governs American life is run by absolute fucking numbskulls who have no idea what they're doing. Yeah, I buy and it. it. Yeah. Plausible. I get it. I get it. But like, like the, the fucking the FBI or the U.S. Marshal Service, if they were booking someone into jail on like a minor drug trafficking charge, they would have this shit sewn the fuck up. I mean, it's just like the incompetence things only goes so far when you see so many other people getting fucking nailed to the wall with every mil possible millimeter covered of just squashing out their life and throwing them into the carceral system that like. I, I just don't buy this idea that the U.S. Marshals are just like, yeah, sorry, we've got to tell anyone he was coming. <laughs> and then logged him in as a black guy. It says, uh, that evening, according to the postmortem reconstruction, a facilities assistant found Mr. Epstein in his Giselle looking distraught, sad, and a little confused, she said in an email to three jail officials. When the assistant asked if he was okay, he said he was. But she was not convinced, she wrote. He seemed dazed and withdrawn. She added, just to be on the safe side and prevent any suicidal thoughts, can someone from psychology come and talk with him? No one did at first, according to records. Okay, so let's just go back here. So um, the U.S. Marshals forgot to, forgot to tell anyone he was a high-profile inmate. Uh, he was booked into prison as a, basically as a completely different individual in general population. And then from the minute he was in jail, we have a paper trail being created of people writing in official emails, he looks sad. He looks withdrawn. He looks like he's sort of lost the will to live. Better check up on that and send a psychologist to you know further backstop this alibi here. You know what I mean? Like it's just sort of like a narrative is already being constructed, and this is what I find interesting about this article here. Yeah, they sh they let him watch the ending of Game of Thrones, <laughs> <laughs> so he would feel all sad and vaguely confused, very devilish. <laughs> On Sunday, July 7th, the center's warden, uh, Lamine uh, Nade, properly identified Mr. Epstein as a high pro as high profile and had him move, move to the special housing unit, or SHU, on the ninth floor, out of concerns for his personal safety and general population, according to Mr. Hurwitz's email. But it was not until 9.30 a.m. that Monday that Mr. Epstein was taken for an initial psychological evaluation, as had been suggested when he arrived. That afternoon, Mr. Epstein was set to make his first court appearance. Anticipating that he would be denied bail, the jail's chief psychologist recommended that he be evaluate, evaluated for suicide risk upon his return, given the media attention and nature of the charges. I mean, like, do you know how many people kill themselves in Rikers Island every year? Like, I mean, like, are, is, is the teenager who has uh, been in Rikers for five years for hopping a turnstile that everyone forgot about? I mean, are they, are, are, like, when they're booked, do they go, God, he looks sad. Do you think the fact that um, he's being uh, lost in this Kafka-esque nightmare with like no hope for the future or of ever getting out or even knowing what he's charged with would lead him to kill himself? I don't know. Let's book him some time with a psychologist. It's just, it, it, like you said, at the same time, it's like everyone is perfectly incompetent, but there's this like boutique psychological treatment for every fucking, uh, every inmate that's awaiting like or serious charges or maybe denied bail. I mean, like, again, you can believe everyone's incompetent, but like what we know about the U.S. prison system is that it is like comprehensively hell on earth for everyone involved in it. And then there's just all these emails being like, he looks sad. <laughs> can we cheer him up? Is there anything we can do for the guy? He just looks so down. Yeah, they had um, they had um, NBA Youngboy, who's a pretty popular rapper. They had him in federal lockup in Utah for from March until like last month. I do not remember anything like this about him. And his charge was way less serious. <laughs> It's no one seemed to lose track of him either, interestingly. Yeah. <laughs> Inmate Epstein will likely be receiving bad news in court today and has multiple risk factors for suicidality as identified by BOP statistics, the psychologist wrote. Let's be proactive. I mean, 
I, I just, I'm sorry, like bureau, federal bureau of prisons officials, I do not believe that they are proactive in like s- sort of buttressing the mental health of people trapped in their gulags. I, most of the, yeah, most of their prisons are designed to make people want to kill themselves. <laughs> uh, so it goes, um, Mr. Epstein spent his nights pacing his cell, sleeping fitfully, and talking with other inmates, according to handwritten notes taken by those observing him. Often the entries were mundane. Epstein is drinking water at the sink. But some were more evocative, suggesting at once his grim predicament and his unrealistic expectations. Epstein is sitting on the edge of the bed with his head in the palm of his hands, one inmate wrote on July 29th. (laughs) I mean, I would imagine that would be like a common position for you if you're in a jail cell awaiting fucking trial for (laughs) sex trafficking or or anything. It's just like, uh, wow, this confluence of details just seemingly seems to add up that he was really not happy being in jail. In conversations with his minders, Mr. Epstein seemed to stick to subjects that would convey the impression he was approachable, yet well-connected and successful. Epstein and I are talking about the escort business, an inmate wrote, 8 o'clock one evening. An hour later, Epstein and I are talking about arbitrage. 30 minutes more, Epstein is talking about celebs he knows. The notes do not name any of the celebrities. (laughs) Wow. <laughs> Those are all the redacted documents that the New York Times couldn't get access to. Did they have Vicky Ward in there in a DUI? What the fuck? In another inmate, uh, in another entry, an inmate noted that he and Mr. Epstein had talked about driving taxis in New York. We both drove, the inmate pointed out. Throughout it all, Mr. Epstein remained curious about his surroundings. On one of the first evenings, he asked an inmate whose name was redacted from the records about the kinds of crazy things he had seen in jail. Close to midnight, an inmate reported Mr. Epstein was offered dinner, but refused it because it was nasty. He is right. <laughs> uh, the next the next subhead for this New York Times article is a, the quote, being alive is fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's up, man? Okay. On the morning of Tuesday, July 9th, Mr. Epstein underwent the requested formal in-person suicide risk evaluation. The psychologist whose name is redacted from the documents, it's actually <laughs> Jolly West, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the psychologist whose name was redacted from the documents found Mr. Epstein to be polite, cooperative, organized, coherent, and even showing a sense of humor. Epstein adamantly denied any suicidal ideation, intention, or plan, she wrote in her notes. He requested a phone call, a meeting with his lawyer, a shower, and to brush his teeth. Mr. Epstein described himself to her as a banker with big business and said that being alive is fun. He denied having sexually abused anyone and said he would have, a, had a, would, would have a renewed bail hearing the next week where he believed he would be released. He was future oriented, the psychologist wrote. She concluded that suicide watch was not warranted, but that out of an abundance of caution, Mr. Epstein should remain on psychological observation. The next day, Mr. Epstein asked to be single-celled, but was told he could not be housed alone for safety and security concerns. And the day after that, a psychologist wrote, he was smirking and said, why would you ever think I would be suicidal? I'm not suicidal, and I would never be. Once again, we have this thing where, like, uh, prison psychologists and the prison itself are noting in the official record in their log entries over and over again that he seems sad, despondent. Um, but, you know, like maybe, but also like unrealistic expectations about like his future. And then Epstein, <laughs> knowing who he is <laughs> and what he probably knew, made very sure to say <laughs> to his jailers and his psychologists over and over again that I'm not suicidal <laughs> and I love being alive. Life fucking rocks, dude. It's my favorite. <laughs> Never kill myself. I love life. My life a movie. <laughs> <laughs> my life an illegal movie. <laughs> The logs are always goes here. Uh, the logs are also revealing for what they lack. Any sign of visits by the famous and wealthy friends he socialized with after his 2008 sex offense convictions in Florida. Instead, the logs show a far more mundane cast of visitors, including a parade of lawyers. On July 18th, it became apparent that Mr. Epstein was unlikely to return to his former life and friends anytime soon, if ever when Judge Richard M. Berman denied a renewed bail request. Five days later, in the early morning hours of July 23rd, Mr. Epstein made his suicide attempt. The denial of bail was cited as a significant disappointment for Mr. Epstein and likely challenged his ability and willingness to adapt to incarceration, according to to the postmortem psychological reconstruction. Given the potential impact of the judge's decision, a psychologist should have assessed Mr. Epstein's mental status upon his return to the institution, it said. 
He was removed from suicide watch after about 31 hours, according to the documents, and again placed on psychological observation. Do they talk about that psycho? Yeah, that, who? When, like, when did that guy try to Giddy? kill him? Yeah, yeah. Like, what the? That's the suicide the guy, attempt they're talking yeah, about. Yeah. That guy. Yeah. No, the, 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 uh, that's what I was saying. Like, and it's, it's very unclear in this in this article. They're like the first suicide attempt that didn't work, and then he was like not placed on suicide watch after that. I think they're referring to that roided out Long Island cop that murdered all those people for the cartel and fucking tried to kill him. Yes. No, that's exactly the thing they're talking about. It was not a the suicide attempt. Evil, yeah, the evil Mr. Clean. <laughs> yeah. The, like, no, talk about that guy, guy in our very were, first episode with Truanon. Yeah, the guy who he... he Tataglione. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, who... He was a dude who was burying people in his front yard in Westchester. And, like, uh, again, like, they, they don't... Like, there's not a lot of details about this first suicide attempt other than that he was taken off suicide watch. Yeah. Uh, he goes, um, in conversations with people from psychological services over the next week, Mr. Epstein repeatedly denied having suicidal thoughts. He smiled and cracked jokes. He told them he was Jewish and suicide was against his religion. <laughs> Felix's theory is being uh, further, further, uh, further buttressed by uh, the, 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 the documents here. I will be the new Frank Church. I will be the senator from New York. <laughs> he also reiterated complaints about the running toilet in his cell, which left him feeling agitated for hours. He said he sat in the corner and held his ears, a psychologist wrote. Mr. Epstein speculated that he might have autism, noticed, noting that Dustin Hoffman's autistic character in Rain Man had an aversion to noise. <laughs> 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 yeah, the, uh, got, the, got, yeah, gotta call it. Wexner. Gotta call Wexner. Yeah. <laughs> got a three thirty Wexner. That's when the inmate notes get more specific. Yeah, he talked to me about Beyblade for six hours. <laughs> Knew the name of every Bionicle. <laughs> um, some within the justice system uh, voiced concerns about his mental state. Federal marshals who had escorted him to a July 31st court hearing returned with a prisoner custody alert notice, which said Mr. Epstein might have suicidal tendencies. It uh, turns out he was just wearing a T-shirt of his favorite band, <laughs> Suicidal Tendencies. <laughs> All I want a Pepsi, and shit was given to me. This prompted another suicide risk assessment by a psychologist. Mr. Epstein again denied having suicidal thoughts. The psychologist was persuaded, according to the documents, writing that a suicide watch was not warranted. He stated he lives for and plans to finish this case and go back to his normal life, the psychologist wrote. Among the documents attained by the Times was an undated sign on an orange paper that read, Mandatory rounds must be conducted every 30 minutes on Epstein, prisoner number 76318-054, as per G God, G-O-D. The word mandatory was misspelled and underlined in pen, and the question mark was written after it. The records offered no explanation of the sign, and bureau officials declined to answer questions about it. Epstein, as per God. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Mandatory misspell. This is like the Lionel Hutz card. No, <laughs> money down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so I guess the last day. When he arrived back in the shoe on July 30th, Mr. Epstein was given a, cef a cellmate, Ephraim Reyes, a prisoner who was assisting the government in a drug distribution conspiracy case. Mr. Epstein complained that the man's talking kept him awake at night. That all changed on August 9th when Mr. Reyes was transferred out of the jail and the staff was alerted that Mr. Epstein would need a new cellmate. We know what's coming. I mean, yeah, he got a new cellmate. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, the same day, the day before Mr. Epstein died, as he huddled with his lawyers in a conference room, a federal appeals court unsealed about 2,000 pages of previously confidential documents in a defamation lawsuit against Jelaine Maxwell, his longtime associate and former girlfriend. Ms. Maxwell, who was charged last year with sex trafficking and other offenses, faces trial this month in Manhattan. The materials revealed highly disturbing details at Mr. Epstein's alleged sex trafficking ring, including graphic depositions, police reports, and an Amazon receipt for books like Training with Ms. Abernathy, a workbook for erotic slaves and their owners. Officials later surmised in the psychological reconstruction that the document release worsened his mental state further eroding his previously enjoyed elevated status and potentially implicating some of his associates. I mean, I don't buy this. He's been booked for sex trafficking charges in prison, and I don't think his status could erode any further at that point. However, the note about implicating potential some of his associates is interesting to me. That evening, according to the reconstruction, a unit manager at the detention center helped Mr. Epstein make a social phone call. 
again, like, are you allowed to make just, I mean, I guess you are allowed phone time in prison, but like, I don't know. This just seems like he's just asking people, hey, can I make a phone call? And they're like, sure. It's like, it's fucking like camp or something. I don't know. The manager dialed Mr. Epstein and let him speak for 15 minutes. The call was not properly logged and does not appear to have been recorded. It is not clear from the documents whether the call was on a monitored line. I asked inmate Epstein who he was calling, the unit manager wrote. He stated his mother. Mr. Epstein's mother died in 2004. The call was to his 30-year-old girlfriend, whom he had helped put through dental school. This said three people with knowledge of the phone conversation. I mean, if this call wasn't logged or monitored, how would any three people have knowledge of the conversation? And who are these people? Interesting question. Who are these people? Mr. Epstein, they said, gave no indication during the call that he planned to kill himself. The call that night, however, was not included in the phone logs provided to the Times by the Bureau of Prisons. The logs show only one call, social, only one social call during his stay more than a week earlier to uh, Miss Shuliak, his girlfriend. After finishing the call, Mr. Epstein returned to his cell where he was alone because no new cellmate had yet been assigned. He was also left unmonitored by two officers on duty whom prosecutors later accused of spending their time surfing the internet and appearing to be asleep. <laughs> a psychological profile later revealed that the guards were sleeping in a hammock with a single feather being <laughs> perpetually pushed up and down as they went. Uh, this May, the two officers entered into a deferred prosecution agreement on charges they had falsified jail records about checking on Mr. Epstein. At 6.30 the next morning, he was found with a bed sheet tied around his neck like a noose. He was pronounced dead an hour later. About two months after Mr. Epstein's death, an inmate who appears to have worked in the kitchen emailed the psychology department about a conversation he had with a man whose cell had been next to Mr. Epstein's. He said the other inmate had told him, Jeffrey Epstein definitely killed himself. Any conspiracy theories to the contrary are ridiculous. The man had heard Mr. Epstein tearing up his sheet before committing suicide, the kitchen worker wrote. He wanted to kill himself and seize the opportunity when it was available, he added. Such is life or death in this case. That's the end of the article. The end of the article <laughs> is a detail about how a guy who worked in the kitchen emailed the psychology department about a conversation he had with a man whose cell had been next to Epstein's. And that man's, that man's opinion, or that, that man's just stating for the record that Epstein, quote, definitely killed himself. And the evidence for this is that the guy he talked to who had been the cell next to Epstein heard him tearing up sheets before committing suicide. Well, I mean, he could have heard someone tearing up the sheets. But I mean... Oh, he heard him. He was saying, uh, I'm, I'm Jeffrey Epstein, and I love tearing sheets before I kill myself. It's my favorite thing to do. I used just, to love being alive, but this is actually even better. Being dead. Being dead is awesome. Be, being dead is the new being alive rules. <laughs> I mean, again, like, I've, it's it's so weird that the New York Times published this article, like, you know, the week before Jelaine's case, and on the, week, and on the anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, too. Mm. Very funny. But, like, I can't help but think that this article is written to give you the unmistakable conclusion that Epstein absolutely was murdered in prison because the constellation of details in this article that are supposedly exonerating or like, you know, uh, case closed on any conspiracy theory are so fucking strange. And then the, the conclusion in the last paragraph of this like jailhouse informant, two degrees of separation away from Jeffrey Epstein is the final word on the fact that he definitely killed himself is so fucking odd. It's either they're not trying at all and they don't care because they don't have to try or they're trying to send coded messages to, to, to true seers and investigators in this case. Because, again, like the constellation of details here is so odd about how he kept telling people on the record that he didn't want to kill himself. And look, I mean, like you may say that and then may end up killing yourself because like, you know, you're in jail and facing life behind bars. OK, fair enough. But then the fact that jail officials, even after his first suicide attempt, kept taking him on and off suicide watch and then kept creating this weird paper trail where they were like, yeah, this guy definitely might kill himself. Better follow up on that. And then didn't follow up on it ever, but had emails just saying, it's sort of likely this guy's going to kill himself, right? We should probably, you know, take pro. Even though he keeps saying he doesn't that. want to, even though he's pretty adamant in, in the words that he says that he doesn't want to do it. Very strange, but I would say very fascinating uh, news article here by the New York Times. 
And just like, okay, the, like the fact that they're like, oh, this is based on all these new documents that we got. By the way, m- many of those documents were heavily redacted and not released to us. Yeah. And also, there, there's no explanation for like why all of these phone, like the, the last phone call he made before he uh, died was not logged or monitored by anyone. But sources assure them it was to his girlfriend. Well, I mean, uh, you know what I make of all this. I mean, it's just, it's uh, how you could read this article and come away thinking that he wasn't murdered is astonishing to me. Uh, I'm sorry, but the guy who was was in the kitchen uh, and heard from the other guy who was next to him said that he did, which is evidence that if you were to use it to claim a conspiracy would absolutely be accepted by the New York Times. In the Bloomberg Opinion article, they talked to El Chapo's lawyer, who, you know, as a high-profile inmate facing a high-profile trial, went through a similar process. I would just like to compare the details of their incarceration. What do you think the chances are that any of El Chapo's calls to his mother, girlfriend, (laughs) friends, associates, social calls were not monitored and logged by the Bureau of Prisons? I mean, if that's the case, I'd love to know about it. Another spectacular bungle on their part. <laughs> what are the chances that El Chapo could have killed himself in that jail cell? Or that the guards who were told to check up on him every half an hour to make sure he doesn't hang himself were just sleeping all night or surfing the internet? What are the chances that if he did kill himself or died under mysterious circumstances, they could talk to like a guy who talked to a guy who was just like, yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> what what about again like I, I go back again what about like what you know firsthand of or what you simply read about or know through like just just your gut feeling about what it's like to be incarcerated what it's like to be in print like in 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 jail awaiting trial in this country at like Rikers or the MCC or any of these facilities where you're like held you know denied bail awaiting trial like does the per- portrayal of his treatment by the Bureau of Prisons line up with just what your gut feeling or what you've read about what it's like to be incarcerated in this country is. Does, does it line up, would you say? And again, does Al Chapo's being held in custody in a very similar facility who made it to every fucking minute of his trial and is now, I think, in, what, ADX Florence or something and now in Supermax? Like, how come none of the guys in Supermax have been able to kill themselves yet? The Unabomber, like any, any of these guys, like you think they might want to kill themselves after being like in a closet 23 hours a day for the rest of their lives. But for some reason, that's impossible for them to do. Oh, right. Because it's like it's these facilities are designed to make sure that you can never end your suffering while while at the same time making you want to kill yourself every second of the day that you're awake. Doesn't right, it doesn't right. add up. I mean, like, doesn't add up. Right. No, no. Well, I do. I do really like my favorite like interpretation of this whole affair is when people take like the Elizabeth Warren approach to it where they're like, there are some structural issues with prisons (laughs) and it's like, well, yeah, no shit. But like, I don't, I don't think that's all of the thing here. I think you're kind of missing the forest for the trees. I mean, like, I mean, it's, it is, it's like mostly out of public conversation. So they got what they wanted. Yeah. Like I said, if, if you were just, you know, if you were sent to Rikers because of like, you know, some fucking uh, some misdemeanor that was never fucking adjudicated or some petty crime or something like that. And they just like lose you in the system. Like, you know, there, there are there are dozens of examples of like teenagers being sent to Rikers Island and then just forgotten about, like not even charged with a felony who have been there for years in like the most nightmarish conditions imaginable for a person. And then when you make like when when you set up this idea that like you know everyone is just so fucking bad at their jobs that like anything can happen like okay true that happens every day we see that all the fucking time but like there are so many examples of like the government or these same institutions being 1000% on point when they want to be it's just a question of like when when do they get to be incompetent and just like you know uh, the keystone cops and when do they get to be like the most powerful government in the world and I think the disparity between when and who this happens to is quite telling. So there we go. That's, a, that's, that's the, the life and death of the Jeffrey Epstein. Um, good luck to Jelaine on the, uh, the trial. Uh, best of luck to her and her attorneys and, and to everyone on the jury. Because, you know, I mean, it, it, it would suck not being able to, as you said, read articles <laughs> or watch the news for as long as this case takes. Um, we, do, we do have some good news to close out on. What's that? The the uh, Obama Clinton installed 
narco government of Honduras was defeated. Shimora uh, Castro becoming the oh, first right, yeah. female leader of Honduras. Uh, yep. That's pretty cool. That is good news. Um, yeah, no, th- th- this is this is literally the government that Hillary Clinton like oversaw a coup of. Yeah, and she, and, she, wait, no, yeah. Uh, Castro is the wife of the president who was deposed in that coup. And uh, yeah, this is also a big uh, Lanny Davis thing, Honduras in two thousand nine. So this is it has been a lot of doom and gloom lately, but it is no, this is something that it's nice to see even though it's correcting something terrible that's been done to the, that country for over a decade. Um, also good news, uh, Matt, you saw the new Ghostbusters. Can you give us just a little hint of Muncher? I got to say, Muncher surprised me. Uh, so uh, Muncher, you know, miserable green creature, it was originally in the promotional footage that was first debuted, I think, five years ago now, uh, was in a cornfield and i stupidly assumed oh this the muncher he munches corn he he's sort of an avatar for america and our obsession with miserably choking down corn slurry uh but then i watched the movie and muncher actually does not munch corn uh muncher munch? eats metal which means really? he's more of a avatar for deindustrialization i guess <laughs> uh <laughs> But I think even more interesting than that is that, and this is a spoiler alert, so you can stop listening if you're really invested in uh, seeing the full muncher displayed. The kid, the Ghostbusters in this movie are children. Okay, it, it's it's the They're granddaughter of uh, of Egon Spangler and uh, the the grandchildren of Egon Spangler and their friend who is named Podcast. What's up? And they find Muncher in an abandoned, I think, like ethanol refinery. And they try to bust him, and he shoots at them with the, the with the metal that he chews, which means he's basically trying to murder them because like their bullets he's they're like firing a claymore. at like speed, <laughs> yeah. and the kids have to like duck down. So he's essentially a mass shooter. So once again, uh, another facet of the American experience contained in his his disgusting blue form um did josh gad provide the grunts and squeals for much you know he did (laughs) so we got so gad is in ghostbusters we got the gad grunts we got the gad squeals also ghost harold ramus in a sequence towards the end that is legitimately upsetting i mean didn't he die like a long time before this movie was being made is it it a few years ago yeah okay he died he died before the um the Lady Ghostbusters. Okay, so this is this is just pure CGI Harold Ramis. Oh yeah. Ooh. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. He's like, hey everybody, I'm I'm in hell. I'm back back from hell here. It's weird because he's a ghost, and at the end he comes in to help them bust other ghosts. So he is sort of a ghost Uncle Tom. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's a scab. G- Gad also provides the grunts of squeals of Ramis. Just uh, interesting fact. Wait, Gad does you... Harold Ramis's voice? No, I'm kidding. Okay. Wouldn't it be great? No, there's no, he doesn't say anything. I guess they thought that would be a little uh, uh, a bridge too so far. Wait, wait, they... wait. It's just it's just an image. It's just an image of Harold Ramis, like a CGI like cutscene. Harold Ramis just waving. No, he g- helps bust a ghost. He but he doesn't his speak. Grandkid at one point. Ooh. But he doesn't. He goes speak? on way too long. I, I had assumed like, there was going to be a scene like that in the movie, and I thought it was going to be just a brief, yeah, like a waving like sort of Anakin at the end of uh, Return of the Jedi. But no, it's like an extended sequence. But 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 in silence. He he doesn't talk. He doesn't talk, no. Like, Grandpa, we've missed you. Yeah, he just stands there. Although <laughs> I mean, not as be- haunting as uh, the images of the actual still-alive Ghostbusters wearing their Ghostbuster <laughs> outfits and looking at <laughs> all of them uh, like they're begging for death. It would be cool to do. Um, you you like make the Jeffrey Epstein movie, and it's like, it's like Soderbergh, and it, like it, 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 like looks really good. But then they're like, wait till you see who we have playing Jeffrey Epstein, <laughs> and there's a big reveal, and you see it at the end of the trailer, and it's Gad. <laughs> <laughs> Gad provides the grunts and squeals of Epstein as he's being strangled by deep state operatives. I would. That's how I would do it. Yeah. If I was a director, <laughs> it would be. It would be pretty good. Epstein singing a song. Well, whether he was murdered or committed suicide, he's with Muncher now. <laughs> he's with Muncher. <laughs> he's, 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 he's munching. That's true. Uh, all right. Well, uh, like I said, yeah, that does it for today's episode, everybody. 